Hi all, let's have a look at game 9 of the World Chess Championship 2021. So this does actually feature one of the worst blunders in World Chess Championship history, in my view, especially recent history. So Ian Neponimarchi was playing white and kicked off with c4. Magnus played e6. So this move invites sometimes a transposition, for example, if d4 knight f6 we could have a nimzo engine with knight c3 allowing the pin that's the nimzo engine named after aaron nimzovich or we could have a queen's engine so you can see how it can transpose into other openings from this move e6 or white can try and keep it as an english opening and white did that with g3 we have d5 bishop g2 and magnus actually does play d4 this seems a little bit controversial because it weakens black on the light squares a little bit but that's trade-offs in chess sometimes you do have to to do something you do have to have a downside a cost that you're willing to pay for knight f3 knight c6 here if d3 that would be very precarious white could castle and this is only going to favor white for example this situation with g6 b3 this is just an overextended pawn sometimes if it doesn't uh, take on e2 it becomes a kind of liability pawn for example like this where actually you know it can be undermined eventually the structure is not that stable so black should avoid this kind of thing this this would be a not not very good idea so d3 although tempting and you know it seems to be allowed by white it's, it's better it seems to play knight c6 there's a modest amount of territory not too much so it's always like balancing things. Sometimes you don't want too much, you don't want too little, it's a balance. Here, knight c6. So white castles. Bishop c5, d3, knight f6, knight bd2, a5, knight b3. The bishop drops back. And now e3, undermining the pawn now. d takes. This leaves a little bit of vulnerability on d3. And this is echoed throughout some variations that d3 could be a little bit dangerous you know from white's perspective we see knight g4 and we see now how this move is very energetic instead of the routine casting move knight g4 does actually spell out some concrete issues with d3 so bishop c5 is played there's not too many moves it seems if bishop f4 black could play e5 and here if the bishop goes to d2 then queen takes d3 or if the bishop goes back to c1, you know, we've got things like a4. So that parking space has been used. And then queen takes d3. Yeah, so, you know, or bishop c4. Yeah, as, as mentioned, you know, this this is, uh, it's dangerous for d3. So bishop c5 is played. Okay, and now Magnus just castles. He lets white take. There's an expression to take is a mistake. If black had taken on c5 it does give white a little bit of something with d4 it should be a small edge for white in this position so it's good to actually just castle and let white take on e7 we have d4 a4 and the bishop does take on e7 queen takes knight c5 and now a3 this was an interesting moment indeed especially for those of us watching the game live and I was watching the game live on the chess and you know the analysis indicated you know the engines indicated b4 was was a good idea for white it seemed to be aligned to the bishop fianchetto to kind of amplify it on the diagonal if there could be some sort of focal point on b7 later so b4 does seem like a very very interesting try instead of what was played which was b takes a3 I was a bit surprised by this move I thought b4 was pretty dynamic and if we look concretely at this, if knight takes b4, rook b1, black cannot really take on a2 because the knight's kind of trapped, which is an interesting theme of this game, <laughs> pieces being trapped. So say e5 trying to undermine c5 in return, rook e1 keeps that pawn pinned, so this knight can be eaten at leisure, it seems, when it's convenient. And here knight d3 protects the queen there's no issue there so this would be in white's favor so it seems as though uh you know b4 is plausible if rook d8 rook e1 
here if knight takes b4 h3 this situation is also fairly interesting you can see it's counterplay generation for white and this pawn hems in the rook you see this contrast to the game that we're about to witness the rook's been hemmed in by its own pawn and this situation should be a little bit in white's favor as an example and you can see that this does seem strategically relevant to kind of weaken black on the light square so this i believe should have been played before this seems a very very good try anyway by the evidence of our super high powered engines of course uh, so b4 seems as though that was a move to play to consider instead b takes a3 was played and this seems a little bit of a let off it's an extra pawn sure but it's an active rook it seems to make the position a little bit easier for black to play and these hanging pawns here without pawns on the adjacent sides they're a little bit vulnerable sometimes for example black might be threatening knight takes d4 to undermine c5 so the knight goes out of the way and now knight f6 is played and it looks as though this is quite a pleasant position for black who's going to be able to re-get the you know the pawn and magnus does that with queen takes a3 so the hanging pawns usually the hanging pawn structure and funny enough i was only looking at a game of emmanuel lasker crushing someone with hanging pawns but it's usually very effective when both bishops are on the board and d5 kind of liberates a bishop but there's no bishop there liberating to the king. You know, there are some magnificent examples of hanging pawns being a formidable force, but it doesn't seem to be the case in this situation. The effectiveness of them seems to be very limited here. And in fact, Magnus plays h6, affording a waiting move, just a waiting move, h6. Okay, taking away g5, I mean, that could be a dangerous square that white could have used later. h4 is played. Maybe there's also an idea, perhaps one day, g5 in the right circumstances to undermine d4. So h4, you know, it seems a little bit surprising, but maybe one of the main functions is preventative against g5 later at some point. It does weaken the light squares a little bit, though. Everything's at a cost in chess, as in life. You've just got to be able to make sure you, that the downsides that you create are not very exploitable. I think this is the magic that Emmanuel Lasker added to Steinitz that sometimes you can have seemingly you know bad downsides but if they're not actually exploitable then they're not really you know downsides other elements might be compensating and they they might be invisible very dynamic elements like peace counterplay so the elements are interchangeable and okay bishop d7 it looked at this point that this bishop is a little bit on the passive side on e8 but it does provide like French defense bishops, it does provide solidity on the light squares. When people are quite quick to say a bishop is bad, sometimes they don't really see the upside of bad bishops. They do add solidity to the position. And actually, this uncovers a threat. The knight had weakened d4. Black is threatening knight takes d4 now. There was a weakness of the last move there. So knight takes d4 is on the cards. We have queen e3 protecting d4. And now queen b4 is played. This implies potentially that there's a nasty pin. But it also implies that taking will weaken c4. So here we see rook e b1. And in fact, the pin, although I thought was kind of lucrative, it wasn't played. Knight takes e5. This is a very interesting continuation instead. Just making these pawns slightly weak, we have queen e1. Offering the exchange of queens, which is good news for Magnus if he just, you know, potentially wants just a draw, he can now get off queens quite safely. You know, queens are going to be sometimes the, the winning ingredient of, of many games. When the queens come off, it's more likely to be a draw in general. Here, if queen c5, it seems black could play queen takes and then knight takes e5 and be fine. Rook takes b7, c6, and with c4 weak. And with pressure on a2, look at both the black rooks. This is quite an active position for black. There are active possibilities. There's an outpost on a3, potentially if the slight of a moves, or rather a square to use on d3 sometimes. This is an active position. So as an example, knight takes c4, you know, just giving the pawn back. It's, it should be even. And it's tricky, you know, for white to be able to use that past a pawn. It seems a pretty academic past a pawn there. So queen e1 was played, and the queens came off. And now just actually just calmly h5 
it gives the knight a square reverse gear. So the knight's not going to be trapped with moving like f3. So this is reinforcing e5. The knight needs a square. But black's position is pretty active here. But what about b7, you might ask? b7 is taken. But now, yeah, black's position is really quite kind of active after rook a4. And this is a very, very interesting situation where, in fact, the Pommel Archie goes incredibly badly wrong with this next move. Just one move, he throws away kind of hours of effort. He played c5. Can you see what the issue is with c5? Actually, before we <laughs> do that, if rook e c1, then maybe the, the, the concern is knight. Pardon me. The concern might be knight takes e5. And, you know, for example, you know, c4 dropping off shortly after, it's, it's a bit unpleasant. The way to go, it seems, is f3, you know, and here, bishop e4. Because if c5, there's an issue which is revealed in the game. Yeah, so let's let's say bishop e4, knight f5. This situation looks to be on the equal side. For example, here, even though white is technically a pawn up, it's not anymore, is he? <laughs> because these pawns are on the fire. Yeah, activity, easy to play this, and activity is, is going to usually help you get material back. And black should be absolutely fine here. It's equality. So that maybe there's a concern about just nothing to play for. So c5 was played. So what's the issue for 100 points, you think, with the move c5? Very interesting issue. And it's it's quite rare for this to crop, you know, crop up in uh, a World Chess Championship match. Although the 1972 Fischer Spassky World Championship match had a blunder, you could say, is analogous to this one for the same sort of reasons. So, what is the problem with c5? And we're not talking about uh, Sinclair c5s. We knew the problems of those electric cars, they were ahead of their time too much. But the problem with c5 here. Yes, is that the bishop can be trapped c6. The bishop is trapped. And actually, it's funny, when I went to have a shower, actually, I had a late shower for this guy. I was watching this game avidly, as you do. And, you know, it was like about like 0 or minus 0 0.1. When I came back, I saw it was like minus 3 point something. Oh, what? And why is this bishop trapped? I did actually ask, why is this bishop trapped on b7? Yeah, this this is quite funny, isn't it? I mean, not that funny for, for Napoleon Archie, but it's it's quite uh, a shocker. You, you know, we're just human, aren't we? We're, we're pretending to be good at chess. Everyone's just pretending to be good at chess. <laughs> you know, this is a super elite grandmaster, and this, this happened. So we're all pretending to be good at chess. Yes, the, the secret is out. We're all just uh, tourists in the game. It's only computers that can play the game properly, it seems. Uh, we're all human, basically. And, yeah, the bishop is trapped. You know, there, there are two frats, essentially, two major frats. Rook b8 and rook a7 yes both with that goal of engulfing that bishop you know like in those james bond films where uh the the bad guys have got something in space and they they they, they you know they capture like a a satellite or whatever yeah this this is about to be engulfed this bishop yeah so uh okay f3 is played if rook e b1, you know, rook a7, you know, we'll put this as a demo, rook b8. What happens here, exactly? <laughs> what happens here? Because bishop a6, it's not funny, it's not funny. But if bishop a6, you know, we, we could take on b, I'll put this on the board. We could take on b1 first. And then here, and then this, we've got king f8. This is an example. It does seem a piece up. Yeah, it doesn't seem too easy to rescue the situation. The engines agree it seems to be trapped. So f3 is played, knight h6. Oh, there was another variation. Uh, if rook b1, rook a7, knight c1, yeah, rook b8. I mean, it's the same thing if knight e3. It's just been engulfed. So f3 is tried. We have knight h6. Rook e4. Okay, hitting the rook. The rook drops back. Rook b4, and now this 
kind of pressure on the bishop, which is difficult to parry. A4, rook A takes B7. It does seem like a, a lost position here. Rook B6 is tried. If rook takes B7, let's look at this. There's a variation here after knight D2, rook A7, which shows actually that even if black has to give back a piece, some of the end games are very, you know, promising. This situation here isn't promising at all, actually. This particular one uh, looks as though, you know, this is just a fictional example. Just showing a fictional example. You know, this is just a case where, you know, black's going to unravel and just be, you know, a knight up, basically. And if we even, you know, if we reach this, this is pure fiction now. If we reach this situation, it's still enough, even even if white has two past pawns here, it's not really enough. You know, they can be, one of them could be chiseled out, etc. It's It's not really enough. So rook b6, though, is tried. Rook takes, c takes. Rook takes b6, knight c5. Knight f5. And yeah, it does seem as though the threat on g3 is just ignored, really. a5, rook b8, a6 is ignored again. And now, actually, Magnus does take time out to take that pawn. We see knight a4. If a7, then rook a8. And let's just imagine this scenario for a moment. This is just winning for black. Yeah, there's there's no real problem here. Because there's always a king f8 resource if the rook tries to pin the bishop. Yeah, there's no problem. So knight a4, we have c5. And this gives rise to the possibility of bishop c6, which could be handy for a8 and looking at f3. a7, rook d8. Knight takes c5. And now rook a8. And actually, uh, Napoleon the Archie resigned here. If the game continued with, say, knight b7, bishop c6, knight d6, let's have a quick look at this. Knight f5, f4 as an example. Black could take on d6 and play king f8. And let's just take this a bit further. That even in this scenario, black could actually play like this to actually lose the bishop here and just transpose into a winning rook and pawn ending. The pawns are fragmented here. And this is a technical win, it seems. For example, like this, black can uh, prove progress, basically. Uh, eventually, let me just show you actually the, the more cool variation looked at as an example of proving progress. Rook a3, rook here, f6. King f5, let g7 go to win f4. And you, we, we see that we've got this past pawn in the center and it's going to be, you know, crushing. This, this is a crushing situation uh, arising. It's just winning for black. Basically, even if h5 drops, it's the king and, and the center pawn here. The center, the pawn's coming through will be winning for black. So even if black has to give back a piece, it's, it is a technical win. So yes, an interesting game, a historic kind of blunder game let's go to the end of that rook a8 end of game yeah it's a bit tragic so magnus now is like three points up it seems very difficult to come back from this um basically so yeah what can we say that as tartico has said you know the blunders are all there waiting to be made so surveilling tartico I, i'd recommend checking him out he's one of the hyper modernists he had a lot of things about the humanity of chess and you know, he was a very interesting player. He played, you know, gambits, even like Smith Morrow Gambit. He, he knew that chess is a lot about the blunders. And we can see that witness there, you know, even at this level. But on the other hand, you know, earlier games in the match were very, very exhausting. You know, the first time Magnus won was a, you know, gigantic roller coaster marathon of a game. And one wonders if. In such an intense match over, over several days, you know, exhaustion is, is like going to be a major factor. And in that case, you know, it's a signal for future, you know, world championship matches that the participants, they really need to be in peak physical training as well as mental training. It's, it's really a big, you know, endurance contest not to make those blunders out of the board. So, you know, chess is kind of a sport as well. It's not just a science. It's not just a game of memorization. And, uh, you know, Lasker said that as well. And, yeah, it's 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 a fight, and stamina is going to be a big part of that. You know, both sides' strengths and weaknesses based on just physical stamina, stamina and other attributes are going to affect the game. It does seem to be uh, 
an unfortunate symptom of exhaustion but um yeah because normally you know a player of of the Pimachi's uh, strength would they would not blunder like this even in you know in, in speed games basically so yes a fascinating blunder it shows you know we are just we're all basically just tourists in this game <laughs> it's computers that are good at chess okay but fun stuff i hope you uh got something out of this uh coverage here if you want to check out my courses uh you know kingscraft crusher.tv slash chess courses i've got a new one on the smith morrow gambit which actually Savali tartskoa did actually use in some key games so interesting stuff so i hope you check that out there's still some discounts there for the end of the month uh, big 70% plus discounts to check out there on that courses page. Okay, thanks so much.